This is the Real Coaching Podcast. I'm Joe Filio, back with Paulo Souza. Hi, Joe. How are you? Not bad. Is the season finally over, Paulo? Um, I thought it was it was over, but then uh, but then the, on on the first day of my off season, I had uh, four athletes uh, starting their uh, 2017 uh, season. So yeah, the season the season was over for like. Uh, maybe four hours uh, i don't know in which time zone and uh and then we're back back at it back at the grind there's no off season <laughs> so before we're gonna get started um uh, house- housekeeping business so we i put the podcast on on stitcher uh so for people that use that on on android as well as um iphone people can find the real coaching podcast there and also we're on google play although it's uh, I can't access it because I'm not in the U.S., but somebody can. Tell mm-hmm. us tell us if it works. If somebody subscribe using Google Play and tell us if we're, uh, if we're on there on the on the podcast uh, directory. Yeah, this is good because mo- m- most of the, the, the more intelligent people around the world are on Android, so now they can uh, access uh, easily our podcast. Looks like maybe 30% of our audience, so we, we need more Android listeners. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's do it. So we've got some good stuff to talk about today, some training topics. But first, uh, a brief look at uh, the last couple of weeks of racing and, and probably the, mm-hmm. big, the big one that we both had athletes in and that was an interesting event to talk about was the Island House Triathlon. So we had uh, three days of racing. Uh, the first day was uh, three by individual time trials, uh, uh, individual swim, bike, and then run. The second day... Uh, Olympic distance, but in a different format. What was that? Swim, run, bike, uh, swim, run. And, mm-hmm. and then, uh, which was a mass start. And then the third day, a uh, 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 sprint triathlon, but in sort of reverse GC order so that the first to cross the line would be the winner. So mm-hmm. uh, definitely uh, in- interesting format. Uh, and uh, we had a sort of mix of ITU and, and long course type athletes. And uh, and in the end, it was it was two ITU athletes on the top, but uh, certainly a, a real mix in uh, what we saw in terms of the performance, the readiness to perform, and um, and some people that really took advantage of the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was uh, they they uh, they changed the format for the for this season. Uh, it was uh, definitely different from from last year. Uh, I'm not totally sure if the goal of uh, leveling uh leveling uh the abilities of of draft legal and non-draft uh, athletes was uh was achieved uh but uh but it was i think it was interesting to see also how uh some athletes uh pace themselves through the through the days uh i, I it looks like there were some athletes that uh, that went really hard on the first day and then paid for it the second day also uh I think that experience in the format, especially experience in doing the enduro format, uh, was uh, paid off, and uh, and uh, athletes like uh, like Trenzo uh, ended up being really good at uh, at at the overall format. But uh, it was interesting to follow. I I was a little disappointed with uh, with the, with the social media coverage. Uh, I guess they had some difficulties in the. In the field to to have uh, to have uh, cell cell phone coverage, but uh, but it was still interesting to follow. And obviously, I you had a lot of athletes there. I also had uh, five athletes racing, so so maybe more interesting for us that had uh, had uh, more at stake or uh, like a special interest in the race. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, as you say, the coverage. You know, they um, I think they they tried hard. They used. Um basically the mo- mobile phone coverage they use periscope and, and i saw some some facebook live videos so you could sort of follow along that way um not too many people really following the live streams but that stuff is tends to be archived for for later viewing and i know they were going to do a television production that i'm sure we'll hear about later on but um mm-hmm. but yeah i mean it, it's an interesting one because it's, it's kind of it's kind of a special race because the 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 organizers uh yeah they put a lot of money into it and it's in kind of their home ish territory and um and they attracted a, a really excellent field 
Um, mm-hmm. But it would be nice to see, you know, there's some limitations, as you said, there was the hurricane that blew through there and, and kind of wrecked the coverage for the sun, Sunday uh, race possibility. But uh, if there's one thing that would be nice to, you know, for the, those of us that follow mo- uh, the sport more would be to uh, tighten up the coverage and maybe spend a bit of money on on, on getting some more professional coverage to, to see what's uh-huh. fo- following. Uh-huh. Because there's an opportunity there. There's there's nothing else around that time, you know, and it looked like it was me, you, and a couple hundred other people following. And, and I think it could be a lot yes. bigger. Lo- could be a lot bigger than that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the deal the deal with the, with the social media coverage is that uh, is that it's it's lo- it's something that's like because the standards are so low in expectation uh, people don't expect to to that there's going to be coverage so so then race organizers don't offer the coverage so I would like to see I would like to see a race uh, and and it could be Island House I would like to see a race that uh, that would come out and say like hey we're going to have a big social media coverage and uh, and we're going to see how many impressions can we get can we get from there uh basically to grow uh, a social media audience because you know island house organizers they understand they understand how social media is important you could see that uh, the, the athletes participating were getting uh were getting uh, indications to post on social media you would see you would see them uh posting often about the same team on social media. So, so if, uh, if we're trying to generate impressions and we're trying to generate in, interest in the, in the event through the athletes, then obviously their interest needs to have an outlet and the outlet is following the races while they're, uh, while they're happening. And, uh, and that was, uh, unfortunately not, uh, not achieved. Yeah, I mean the other thing that's interesting is that I know that they're going to push to get everyone to watch it on on US based television, but there's quite an international group of athletes there. The fact that it's mm-hmm. going to be on US television some unknown point in the future is not so interesting, you know, particularly I wouldn't be able to watch it anyway. So I think, you know, spending a little bit of that prize purse to uh to to make a professional coverage that's accessible as it's happening and grab attention as it's happening would would go a long way i mean things things are changing i don't don't know the value so much anymore of Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of lot you know television recorded television well after an event's happened i I think the opportunity to interact with that is low the the relevance to people i mean nowadays is mass market really that important anyway because nobody's watching that that's just flipping through the channels i mean i think they'll triathletes will watch it when they know when it's on television in the u.s but Uh you're you know half the field was international so those people are out of luck if you wanted to follow that so uh, that said credit to the organizers for a very interesting race attracting a great field and and really was great racing um you know with with gwen uh uh coming out on top after probably a uh-huh. cha- challenging last couple of months to to get ready for this and doing her marathon prep and uh, and rich murray on the men's side um uh, not the same situation as gwen but e- equally it's tough to get ready for this sort of october end of season kind of race and also uh, for the ITU guys, I mean, of course, they don't typically ride on time trial bikes. So, you know, some of them didn't even have time trial bikes. <laughs> you know, it's a uh-huh. matter of sourcing uh-huh. all that and getting used to it. And, and um, you know, that presented an a, a equal challenge to to the format. And, um, you know, uh, my only thought was, as as I was watching this, is wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great to, to have this race at a time of year when athletes could really give it a, a, a bigger focus even? Uh, yeah. you know, the, obviously the money is very attractive. I think it was about 60 grand for the winners. So that, uh-huh. that's fantastic. And the top 10 still made, made 10 grand. But, yeah. but at the same time, it's hard to put energy into something like that at the end of the season. There's only just so much you can do. So I did think, you know, if you could have it somewhere else and if you could have the same format and the same money, you know, in a, a different location, different time of year, it could be really uh-huh. big. But at the same time, glad to have races like this because it's still good for the sport. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think another thing that uh, that uh, that contributed for the for the result this season, uh, this this edition was that uh, it was really close to Kona. Uh, it was further away from Kona last year, and uh, and that allowed uh, some of the athletes that raced in Kona to have to have uh, better performances. For example, uh, for some uh, 
for some of the Ironman athletes. For for example, let's pick up on on Sebastian Keenley. I think that uh, he's an athlete that could have done uh, uh, a bit better uh, if if uh, the race was was more of a standalone uh, kind of kind of race and uh, and being so close to Kona kind of uh, affects. Uh, things a little bit but uh but yeah i would i would agree totally with you that uh it would, it would be great to see um it would be great to see this race being uh, being placed in the in the calendar in a way that could be uh a big focus of the season for some athletes uh uh i think we could we could see really interesting uh racing and uh and uh, and it would be you know it would be great for the sport and, and as we saw in the final results, like it really did take a good level of conditioning to pace yourself through the three days and to race well on the third mm-hmm. day. And there was a lot of opportunity mm-hmm. to move even on the third day. So even though the distances are short and, um, you know, the, 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 the road's quite narrow in terms of spacing, et cetera, on the bike, like it, it, it's still an event that I think long distance athletes can be interested in and, and can be competitive in. They did, they did very well mm-hmm. on the whole. So. Um, yeah, interesting race and look forward to seeing if it continues. I hope it continues and in what format it does. Um, there was also the World Cups, the last, uh, last couple of World Cups in the, um, the ITU series, finally. So finally done. Um, from uh-huh. starting, I don't know when the first World Cup is, February, March. So we're here we are in November and uh, we had race in Korea and race in Japan. Any particular thoughts at the end? Uh, not really chasing points here. Uh, some people chasing qualification for various teams or criteria. Others just looking for a little bit of prize money or an opportunity to perform for the younger guys or development athletes that didn't that didn't have that the performance they're after earlier in the season. Uh, yeah, uh, I was actually I was actually uh, over in Asia uh, traveling with my athletes for uh, Tongyong and. Uh, for Tong Young and uh, and Miyazaki, uh, like you said, it was it's like these uh, end of the season uh, at the end of uh, Olympic year uh, races are a great opportunity for developing uh, athletes to get uh, to get some racing at at uh, at a higher uh, at a higher level and uh, and that's what that that was the goal that uh, that we had that. Uh, you know that we had like my athletes uh, had for this for this race and those goals were achieved uh, we had some uh, we had some pretty good results and uh, that was pretty uh, pretty cool to see uh, we ended up having uh, summer winning uh, winning Tong Young and getting second in Miyazaki and uh, Matt McElroy getting another podium getting uh, second in uh, Tom Young and, uh, and Greg Billington finally getting his first podium at a World Cup uh, in uh, in Miyazaki. So it was uh, it was good uh, good races for us. But uh, we're looking forward to uh, next season where uh, where all the when all the the big boys and big girls come out and uh, and play and uh, and we're back at uh, really competitive races. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about athlete development a, a few times, uh, and it, I think this race is interesting from the perspective of, like, say, you talk about a guy like Greg, so you say, well, first World Cup podium, but he's a, obviously he's a an athlete that's he's Olympian, he's racing on the World Series circuit, uh, mm-hmm. but and yet a, a, a lower level race like this can still fit a part of his program, and I think it's something that we probably don't see a, enough of, or or if I think of it in another way. We often see athletes racing the World Series who who are really not always at the World Series level and would benefit from from racing these these smaller races in terms of strategy in mm-hmm. terms of process in terms of you know ticking the boxes on some some things to do well that that the first step might be to do them in a smaller race versus going yes. always in the World Series so you know uh, the opportunity is there. I mean, the, the ITU currently, and in, in the last few years, have had a good structure of prize money. So it's it's you know you can you can uh, young athletes can make the money back or have the opportunity to if they're not funded or 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 if they want to to shoot for a podium and a decent payday uh, and uh-huh. an opportunity to do to do well in uh, in in a different level of race that can be a stepping stone to something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the 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 World Cup circuit is a, is a great opportunity to to just get get some racing and a stepping stone to uh to the to WTS. Uh, very often you see a lot of athletes uh, jumping uh, too soon into programs that are just uh, 
revolve around the WTS and uh, and kind of like uh, take a hit or miss approach. And, uh, and the problems with the hit or miss approaches is that uh, very often there's more misses than hits, and uh, and uh, w- and with the damage that that uh, that causes to develop to the development of athletes. So uh, so for next season, as you know, there's going to be uh, a lot more uh, World Cups uh, around the world. There's going to be a few weekends when, where there's going to be uh, two World Cups in two different uh, continents. And uh, and uh, hopefully the, the prize money is going to stay the same. And, uh, and, and, and that creates an opportunity for, for developing athletes to just, just establish themselves and the way they race and the way they, they operate and, uh, and, and, uh, and with that, uh, and use that as a stepping stone to compete at the highest level. Absolutely. And, uh, probably what we're thinking about going forward, we're doing some planning, we're thinking about next season, we're thinking about what those next steps are and, uh, mm-hmm. makes you think about training and training distribution and, uh, there was a couple things that that got us talking uh, this week uh, before we uh, made the agenda for this show and um one of them was uh, another podcast uh, interview with Vicky Holland um uh-huh. Olympic medalist uh, British athlete um and and in her podcast which we'll we'll link to in in the notes uh, in the cup of try podcast she uh, she talked about the difference between what she's doing in Leeds so she's based in Leeds in in the UK um uh-huh. home of the brownleys and and non stanford uh, amongst others uh, versus their previous program and previous coach uh in Darren Smith and Darren's um, mm-hmm. international squad Darren who is just uh, stepped away from the sport now um, after a long, successful run. Um, and just the difference between the two, and it got us thinking, and, and the way that she described it um, was the difference of, you know, uh, she described the Leeds program as higher volume, more polarized, and we've, we've talked about polarized training in, in this uh, uh-huh. podcast, and maybe she listened to it. Uh, and also perhaps Darren's program, which she interpreted as – more uh higher intensity or or specific training um mm-hmm. and contrasting mm-hmm. between the two and uh it's a favorite talk topic of ours uh, training distribution and, and the effectiveness and and that sort of tied on to to the uh, a tweet by uh Stephen Seiler of uh of previous podcast discussion and 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 uh, fame uh, and the hierarchy hierarchy of <laughs> endurance training needs so i guess first before going on to siler's tweet and talking about that distribution uh, what was your kind of thoughts and uh, on on what vicky was saying about contrasting those programs and how sort of the effectiveness or even in her evolution as an athlete yeah i, I that, that was definitely that was definitely the the most interesting part of the of the of the of that interview i i, I thought it was uh, she she had some really good uh, comments uh regarding the differences between uh, between the two programs uh we already know uh we already know that the the brownlees have uh, has, have a program that's very based on uh, on uh, on volume and uh basically basically a lot of riding uh at i wouldn't say like low intensity but definitely you know, if you're riding uh, an inordinate amount of time a week, if you're riding 20 hours a week, uh, then uh, then necessarily that the, the overall intensity of of riding is not going to be uh, it's not going to be high, and uh, and uh, and it, the same with the running and maybe less with the swimming for for their program, and uh, and then in contrast uh, with uh, with Darren's uh, program. I've I've had athletes that uh, were coached by Darren. You also had athletes that were coached by Darren, and uh, and uh, we we know a little bit about the uh, the approach and the overall uh, uh, way Darren uh, approached uh, approach training, and it ends up being a lot of uh, quote unquote specific training, and uh, and uh, and when you when you're doing specific. Uh, specific uh triathlon training then then necessarily we're gonna we're gonna have a program that's gonna be uh towards uh more uh threshold training so so it was interesting to hear her comments and uh and uh and one thing that that was in my mind when i when i heard 
uh, when I heard uh, how, like her progression and how she uh, kind of like a little bit flourished uh, under the the Leeds uh, program. It's also that uh, it was very powerful, as it is for for a lot of athletes. Very powerful when you when you're able to change your approach completely. Basically, you've worked a few years on one one side of things, and then uh, and then you change your approach completely, and, uh, and there's massive uh, there's massive improvement that comes from that. Just because, just like the change, and uh, we talked about this before. Uh, just just the change and the change in stimulus and just doing something that you were not doing before uh, is a uh, uh, it's a powerful uh, uh, it's a, it induces this powerful adaptations new adaptations and uh, and very often that uh, that means that uh, the level of the athlete is going to increase from that change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, the other thing that that got me thinking is is um, well, first of all, a we should probably we should talk talk to Darren and get and you maybe we'll get him on the podcast to talk about what he actually does and how his practice has evolved over time because you know mm-hmm. when we're tempted to pigeonhole people into the one style of training, it's not necessarily that they uh-huh. stay uh-huh. like that. And the other part is, mm-hmm. of course, when an athlete describes what they're doing. Uh, or what they did, they don't necessarily have the full perspective on on why or rel- relative. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Any, even when an athlete is training with a coach for a certain part of their career in the development, if you like, their understanding then evolves also over time. I mean, it's very colored by what they where they were as an athlete at that time versus where they are uh-huh. later. I mean, now she's talking mm-hmm. about it as a as an Olympic medalist. Well, you know, five years, six years ago, she wasn't in that same place and knowledge uh, as an athlete. So that uh-huh. said, it does, you know, get you thinking about difference of approaches and different approaches for different athletes. One of the thing uh, we're maybe not be able to answer right now, but it does make me think of sort of the the Australian kind of influence of triathlon and how Australian programs developed versus when a more the European approach, if I can generalize to such a degree. I don't know uh-huh. if it's, if it's uh-huh. possible, but, you know, certainly some of my impressions are given high-performance triathlon I mean, you could you could argue that it developed in Australia, and and I think in the early days there was definitely a lot of specificity um, and specific kind of sessions, and might argue that you know what I think of as a European model of training and preparation is actually a little bit different than that. Maybe influenced by the by the early success of the Germans in their approach, for example. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that resonates with you at all, but it does. That did get me thinking about what's the difference between between some of these programs and the genesis of them. Was how, how did they develop in fairly different ways? Thinking the Leeds program, as you said, high frequency, high volume. Most of that volume, low intensity or low deliberate intensity, and mm-hmm. uh, high consistency through the year. Uh, compared to other programs, and this may or may not be Darren's program, but ones where there's a lot of very specific sessions, runs off the bike, swim bikes, swim bike efforts, uh, mini races, you know, we know they do some of that, uh, you know, all of these uh, very specific factors, um, you know, that, uh, you know, when you do focus on a lot of that stuff, you you might not have the energy to do the consistent high volume, high frequency approach of the other. So they do end mm-hmm. up sort of polarized in that way from each other because you can't do both of them at the same time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My thoughts are actually going towards something a little bit different, which is, which is, uh, you know, traditionally let's, let's think about like, you know, traditionally it's going to be like the sixties or the seventies, uh, uh, endurance training was high volume training, and that's how it was uh, how it was uh, always seen. And then somewhere along the line, uh, the idea that uh, we created this idea that uh, that uh, high volume uh, training was was dumb training, and uh, and higher intensity uh, training was uh, was smart training, and that and that kind of and that kind of uh, tendency. Or that kind of thinking still still persists a little bit. So, and uh, and it was more, you know, I don't think I don't think Europeans uh, ever like got away from from the the high volume uh, approach. Uh, 
but uh, but definitely in the U.S. The, the departure from the high volume approach happened, and uh, and with with disastrous consequences. Let's just say that, uh, and uh, particularly when running. And uh, so when when I'm thinking when I'm thinking about threshold versus um, uh, versus polarized or high volume versus uh, high intensity, I, I'm always thinking about how we 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 got away from uh, high volume because we we kind of like started seeing uh, high intensity as a uh, as uh, as smarter training and 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 there's a lot of a lot of that when there's a lot of that when when we 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 encounter the 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 HIIT uh, movement from from the from the you know the last decade or so where we're doing very uh, specific um, interval training is is the smarter way that's that's the where the research is at and uh, and basically going out and riding 20 hours a week uh your bike is is dumb kind of training and uh so so when i'm thinking about these two schools of thought uh in elite training i'm definitely also thinking about how how we perceive those schools of thought and uh and a little bit we're like returning to the high volume as as not as not by being smart, but being by, you know, that's the whole thing regarding polarized training is like being like, hey, uh, f- decades and decades of coaches and athletes kind of like self-selected f- towards this kind of uh, approach to training. So maybe this is what we should be following. We've talked a lot about, you know, the the impact of sports science and the ability uh, and, and widespread availability of tools to measure your training and the impact that tends to have seems to be towards high intensity and towards specificity mm-hmm. you know, i think when when we first got the first power meters on our bike and then we would have athletes do races and then we would look at the races and then you know there's the tendency to try to model then your training around these races you know and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know let's say that there's a race that's you know we will often do stuff like this or look at it and say oh like chicago world champs in it last year you know it had I don't know, 200 accelerations of 10 seconds or something like that. So that you could, uh-huh. you'd be tempted to model your training towards that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, or, you know, a certain number of hills or a certain number of, you know, whatever, because you could measure uh-huh. it specifically and you can get a trace of that. And then you can monitor whether you're doing. And then, you know, that that's not to say that that is ineffective training. However, there's sort of a movement towards that measurement and quantification and, and perhaps, you know, a, a kind of a, in, in the sense, yes, of smarter training because it's more specific. However, uh-huh. you get too far towards that and you're perhaps compromising some of the fundamental principles that then mm-hmm. underpin the ability to do those kind of, those kind of sessions. And, uh, and perhaps that, that doesn't tend to, to work out. You know, I think, as I say, my opinion, the overselling of this ability to measure the overselling of the sports science drive um mm-hmm. has has perhaps got us away in the sense that you can you can look at oh junk training you know this concept of junk training what it, what does that really mean you know or junk miles if you like and mm-hmm. that, that was mm-hmm. a that was a concept that was quite popular you know on the lips of coaches and athletes you know in the last 20 years but perhaps, uh-huh. perhaps that's moving back the pendulum in the other direction in the sense of you know the evidence of what type of endurance loading is effective uh, uh-huh. actually has a lot of frequency and volume involved, and you got to look at that in a holistic sense, not just a session by session. Sure, you know, a one hour run or two hour easy ride in itself is a low stimulus, but you add mm-hmm. in 20 hours, 30 hours of that, and suddenly that's not a low stimulus anymore. And actually, it's a huge aerobic stimulus over time. So, uh-huh. you know, um, but that gets us into into Steven Seiler's hierarchy of training needs and um which it will link to this tweet which is just a pyramid of what Seiler considers the most important impacts of uh various training uh factors on uh, endurance performance and um uh, since we're talking about it, we can, you know, go, go click on the link now in the show notes if you want to uh, see it. But we've got a pyramid and at the bottom, the widest part of the pyramid is total frequency and volume. And he's basically saying this is well established in evidence. Any argument mm-hmm. there? 
No, uh, I think I think that uh, I think that the the this pyramid is is interesting. I would say that like we probably could have a pyramid that uh, where these three uh, components, which are at the base of the pyramid, and the way the way it's designed looks like they're interchangeable. So, and uh, and that's uh, total frequency and volume of training, high intensity training, and uh, training intensity distribution. I would say that these are you know, these are let's say like ninety percent of of the the whole the whole uh, the whole the, of the whole needs of the the endurance training needs. Uh, so basically, these are the big ones. These are the ones that need to have like the biggest focus. Uh, and uh, so the whole concept that we we talked about before of like doing right, doing the ninety percent right. You know. Uh, or the 93 or the 96 or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, kind, kind of like comes through here. So, so I'd say that if visually it would probably not be very interesting, but these three uh, in the pyramid should occupy like a, you know, let's say 90% of the of the pyramid because these three are the biggest ones when uh, when designing an endurance training program. Maybe a better model would be a pie chart or something like that where you could put the relative importance of of these. Of course a, a pyramid by nature does tend to guide you to well, you can what... <laughs> you can come up with a with a filial uh, filial pie pie chart of endurance training needs. I would even argue that that the order here isn't isn't correct. Uh, so the, again, the three the three the biggest parts of the pyramid are training frequency and volume, tra- high intensity training, and then training intensity distribution. And we've had several talks about um, the, the relative value or the importance of high intensity training. And to usually mm-hmm. what we end up talking about is actually the sessions not super important. The, the exact sessions. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but it's more the loading that you get from that. And so then I think the distribution is more interesting in terms of how do you uh-huh. use the doses of intensity within your program? You've only got so uh-huh. many to use. So how, how do you use them? And, and more so than what they are, you know? So yes, okay, they are important, but is, is it not the distribution that makes more difference than, that than what they are and therefore you know a factor that that we've got because they're certainly in triathlon when we're talking about distribution of three sports uh together you know when we're talking uh-huh. about running programs for example or cycling or any of the individual sports that, that make up triathlon i mean it, it's a slightly more simple in the sense that you know you've got your certain number of quality sessions if you like or intensive training sessions and you mm-hmm. distribute those in more or less a you know a linear way. You know, they're mm-hmm. one one's intensity session and then a certain number of lower intensity days typically and then another one, or maybe you stack them together on one day or two days in a row, but then you have more rec- mm-hmm. recovery or low intensity afterwards, where in triathlon we're talking about the interaction of different high intensity sessions across the three sports and 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 then how you do that is is really the the core of the program, isn't it? Uh, yeah so, so I, what you were just saying is and 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 sometimes sometimes I, I i confess that i'm i'm attracted by that concept is that uh is the timing of when the high intensity training happens uh is going to be more important than the high intensity training itself so basically is let's say that uh that you end up having well you want to have two high intensity sessions on the run and two on the bike and two on the swim and they need to happen in seven days. So basically you end up having every day, uh, every day with, uh, with, uh, with an intensity, uh, with a high intensity session. Is that the best approach or is it the best approach to bundle them up in days and then have easy days in the, in the, in the middle? And, uh, and I would, I, I, I confess that I'm towards more, I'm, I'm leaning more towards the, the, on the side of the distribution than the, than on the side of, of the workouts themselves, basically, basically not to worry too much about the volume of intensity, but more about when that intensity happens and with what sequence and how that impacts swim, bike, run training. And, uh, and I, I, yeah, I'm definitely going towards just, just, 
trying to find out what's the combination and what are the days that we can bundle things up uh, more than just thinking about, you know, the epic track sessions or the epic uh, 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 bike workouts uh, because, uh, because it's, it's not about, it's not, it's, I'm more moving more and more towards thinking that the timing and when it happens and just having that intense stimulus is more important than the, the nature of the stimulus itself. Absolutely. I like that concept of the thought of about bundling. You know, I think that's an interesting way to think about it. And, and, you know, as you said, you know, dist- you know, we're talking even distribution through the week or, you know, how do you stack up what you're trying to achieve through the days, you know, in terms of if you want to achieve uh, speed on swimming or, or high power output on biking or speed on running, you have to have a relative freshness to do that. When, when do you put that in the program? How do you do strength and, 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 and more endurance sessions? When, when do you fit that in? So, I mean, that's what, again, makes triathlon endlessly challenging and interesting to, to work with in coaching. And, and also, you know, one of the concepts that I thought a lot about this year is the relative uh, workload you do across these, particularly these high intensity sessions, but also in the total workload, the impact on the other sports. So, you know, if you are trying to improve swimming, um, in, in, tri- in triathlon, you want to become a better swimmer. Uh, you know, if you're always fatigued for the swim sessions and you're maybe not achieving the output you want, you know, is that over time, uh, you know, do you need to take a different strategy, for example, or, uh, you know, because again, we've got to perform, you know, best performances is balanced across all three. You you can't really have a a weakness if you like a substantial weakness, but if you don't, um, if you put too much emphasis, for example, on one session, and I see that a lot with running, big, big run sessions, you know, for example, and um, yeah, as as we kind of were in a thinking similar thinking about this, in that you know these these huge run sessions or big, really monster sessions across any of the disciplines, I find really kind of counterproductive in in the total workload over time perspective, and yet. The counter argument or the uh, the other side of what we're talking about are those that really focus on, you know, the 12 by a K on the track or the huge bike or swim 7K swim session, you know, and, and those, they see those as the areas where the athletes demonstrate their improvement or not. And what we're really saying is actually taking, going lower in the pyramid or the bigger space on the pie chart of actually it's that fundamentally underpinning all this is the total frequency and volume and then how you how you use those intensity distributions, perhaps far more important in terms of performance outcome than uh, in terms of impact on on performance than simply this high intensity period or block of of work mm-hmm. in the week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. You know, I've had I've had experiences with some athletes that for for you know, for, for injury risk, uh, reasons, we end up, uh, not training a lot and, uh, and sometimes using approaches that are centered around, uh, high intensity training. And, uh, and, and what's interesting is a lot of times when we think about, uh, Oh, I'm going to go with a high intensity approach and low volume. We think that, oh, okay, then the high intensity sessions are going to be really long and hard. And then we're not going to be doing a lot of, uh, let's say running outside of that and uh, and uh, and guess what that actually doesn't work that well and what works well is sessions is is if we have like low volume and and the high intensity stuff it's also low volume so basically we're not doing a lot of volume of intensity but the stuff that we're doing is really intense and and with a lot of rest and and those are the those, that's the kind of the approach that I've been having more success with so so it makes me think more and more towards like it's how intense the stimulus we can make it uh, at this particular point in time that uh, that uh, that uh, that's going to make the biggest reason and and then and then on the other hand is well if we're talking about elite uh, training that means that uh, outside of that we're going to be doing a lot of low intensity stuff just because because we can and because we have the ability to do it so. Uh, and and because you know the evidence is there so just let's explore that that side of training 
So so the other parts of the pyramid moving up, so that we've got general periodization in terms of annual periodization. And and the comment by Seller here is, in terms of evidence, unclear but likely overrated. And, uh, yeah, I think that that resonated with me as well. And the, 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 the traditional way of thinking about periodization, uh, I think, is is not really with a lot of evidence, you know, in terms of, you know, linear progressions or, I mean, however, I mean, and there was a trend a while back about reverse periodization, you know, going from... If if traditional periodization is general to specific, then reverse periodization is specific to general, you know, and this, you know, I think all of this kind of thinking is is not really with a, a lot of evidence. And, you know, as sport, the sport has changed and the seasons have got longer and we have, you know, for some athletes, less focus on one particular or a couple of events and others, you know, wanting to, for a variety of reasons, whether we're talking about the ITU World Series or whether we're talking about just surviving as a professional long course athlete, you know, the need to perform pretty well most of the time is is there. And, um, and therefore, the concept of periodization where you move from one uh, focus to another, you know, you go from endurance to strength to speed uh, is maybe not so valid anymore, if it ever was. Yeah, but yeah, but at the same time, it's interesting that uh, it's interesting that uh, that Siler uh, uh, put this uh, put this year. It's obviously that I think that general periodization, the effect of it is unclear. But at the same time, uh, he's had he has a, a recent paper that uh, that I think it's uh, it's available and we can put it in the show notes where where he compared uh, basically uh, three kinds of periodization, like a more traditional, uh, a more traditional uh, something that's that you can call it reverse, and and then something that's more, uh, you know, more of a shotgun approach throughout the 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 intervention period, and uh, and while the three approaches statistically were not different between themselves, uh, the athletes that were on a traditional uh, periodization still did better than the athletes that were on the reverse or the shotgun approach. So, so I think that, uh, I think that the, the overall concept of seeing periodization as uh, general from going from general to specific uh, uh, is, is, I think it's still valid. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we can explore that concept of going from gen- general to uh to specific, I think, uh, particularly when applied to triathlon, or particularly when applied to ITU triathlon, I think we can we can go with timings that are that are a lot smaller than traditional periodization. So basically, and I do that uh, very often. Uh, uh, basically, we have um, we have a race that's in eight weeks from now, and and we we might move uh, we we might use use three blocks, and uh, and they certainly move between. Starting with more general, ending up in more specific or higher intensity, and uh, and uh, and I've I think I've had good good results from from those blocks, and uh, so so I think that instead of just like throwing away like the concept of periodization altogether, I think that there's still a lot to be gained from from uh, from uh, from thinking about your plan. As a periodized plan, uh, but but definitely I would I would say that there's a lot of value in uh, non-traditional uh, non-traditional approaches and uh, and models of periodization that that stray away from traditional and uh, and uh, and more towards more uh, uh, modern stuff or more actual stuff and and stuff for for example like concentrated loads concepts are I think are very attractive in. Uh, in uh, in elite triathlon because because of the ability that our athletes have of of just focusing on something or getting a high load of something at at a particular uh, particularly time particular uh, time in the in the in the process so 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 yeah I would I would say that the effects of periodization they might be unclear but but I think it's still something that we need to be thinking of and 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 plan for it instead of just going with the shotgun approach where we pretty much do the same stuff throughout the year and uh and uh and just and just get progress from just 
repeating it from doing it again and again. If we use the principle that we we started with of the total frequency volume of training as the most the highest significance or the highest importance, then um, you know that that's the most general thing we do is is that you know high fr- total frequency volume. Then then perhaps the differences of periodization that we might have through the year uh, don't change that much. You know, when I think of you know, the volumes and intensities that we're doing. Well, the, the types of intensity change and the types of focus change. The actual volume frequency doesn't change that much necessarily through the year. So it doesn't look, it doesn't look like a pretty graph of, you know, one, two, three down, one, two, three down or something like that. It's, it's much more consistent where then, then you've got to look into more detail of what's actually changing. And I do like the sort of micro blocks of periodization, if you like, or uh, depending on the words you want to use. But yeah, if you've got eight weeks between one race and another, you know, say from May to July, we might go through a whole, what you would normally call periodization process there, where we might return to basic low intensity uh, volume training. And then we might do a couple of weeks of strength focus type work. And then we might come back to race specific high intensity stuff uh, just within that block of time. And that can be quite effective at, at uh, uh, eliciting the kind of performance you're after in a relatively small amount of time. Uh, and then the other thing that this discussion gets me thinking about is um, we've talked about that paper, that Siler paper before about the distribution of intensities is, um, you know, when we try to sort of reinvent the wheel and there's so much this focus on innovation and such and how a lot of these principles, you know, uh, actually are pretty important in terms of they've been tested and, and tried. And, uh, you know, the thing that comes to my mind is, is, innovating in the periodization in the sense of, you know, you see these focus blocks that some athletes do. And there was a bunch last year of, of athletes running, you know, lifetime best 10, 10 Ks in January. And you think, actually, I don't agree with that approach because I question the sustainability of the preparation you need to do to achieve a lifetime best performance for a relatively senior, senior athlete in this case, but any athlete, And then also to be able to maintain that form through the year. So when we're talking about periodization, we're also thinking about the timing of loading, coming back to sort of that on a macro level, that intensity distribution. And, you know, the sustainability of the intensity distribution needed then to elicit these performances, I think, uh, is an underrated concept of, you know, you can't be in a highly specific high intensity training period for many months of the year it's just not sustainable and therefore must be periodized um yeah yeah i think that you know and that that just occurred to me or maybe maybe not but just when we were talking like i think that the the biggest value in general in periodization is 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 predictability of of performance uh so basically is create create the conditions and establish the process and the way to go about things so that we can predict performance when when we need it and uh, and a lot of the times i see that uh, that uh, that when you follow a model that's that that the shotgun model of of not really having a periodization and working on the same things over and over again it uh, it it leads athletes and coaches to to uh, to a thinking process where we're doing we're doing what we always do. We go to this race. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And uh, and it's the kind of approach that I that I really want to stay away from. So basically, yeah, I would say that periodization is the biggest as a concept. The biggest value that it has for me is the uh, the establishment of a process that will lead into uh, predictable performance. I like that predictable performance. That's good. Um, particularly when we're talking about the top of the pyramid and we're talking about tapering. So this is um, the comment here by Siler. It's potentially decisive if you've got one big event and everything else is done right. So he's kind of put the the uh, qualifier on that if everything else is done right. And, um, you know, I, my, my opinion is, you know, often that the, the focus on tapering for one event uh, can, uh, can perhaps lead us astray in terms of what it takes to be having a predictable performance at that event. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, Siler's implication of, of putting tapering at the top, I suppose, is the relative importance is perhaps smaller. And, 
you know, over time, I, I focus more on the predictability of performance and delivering what you know you can deliver rather than, rather than trying to get the 1% better or the, you know, I mean, 1% is a lot in a two hour race, but, you know, the 1% better, you know, trying to go for that, I think often leads athletes performing 5% underdone rather than you know you go for the one percent and you end up uh with an athlete substantially underperforming because they've missed it in some respect because they've not got the timing right because they're only practicing it once a year as opposed to uh if you're uh trying to be predictably good when you expect to be and you can perform and you can do that throughout the year you've got many opportunities to learn about the loading about the pattern about the 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 preparation to the event that allows you to be able to do it consistently well mm -hmm. yeah and 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 now would i would like to stress that and i think i think that's that's what you mean as well like when when i talk about pr predictability of performance doesn't mean that the performance is going to be predictable it's more it's more in the sense that that what we try we're trying to establish the conditions so that the athlete arrives on race day uh uh ready and with the conditions to to be the best that he can be or she can be on on that day so it's not about it's not about uh and i see some of those approaches sometimes and invariably they're they're not sustainable or they end up being exposed by for what they are which is oh i've just uh i've just anal analyzed your data here and on race day you were you know some kind of marker was the best lifetime best kind of deal uh because you know for me predicting predicting performance is 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 not really important it's this is not this is not a prediction game it's a it's a performance game so basically when when i'm talking about pr predictability of performance is how can we in a consistent manner uh, establish the conditions for performance on a given day that we need to and 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 that's that's at, that's the essence of uh of of performance and uh, and it's really hard to achieve and uh, that's what we're working that's what we're working for or one of the things that we're working for uh and and that's where periodization is going to going to come in absolutely i love that you know that concept that when you see and uh, when athletes are or coaches are doing uh evaluations of their build up or or even anticipating prior to an event and and they're talking about these indicators and uh, when they're talking about lifetime best indicators, I often think, uh oh, that's <laughs> that's trouble because the chances that they're going to have a lifetime performance, in my experience, then uh, in the competition that they're targeting are lower. And um, because, I mean, the, the point, as you said, is performance. It's not about testing. It's not about indicators. It's about following a process and then going to perform. And if your indicators are happening at the wrong times, then that's telling you something. And looking retroactive at indicators doesn't mean that you are on track for performance and just something went wrong. To me, it means that the timing was wrong. And we see that all the time in, in, in tapering or racing, you know, athletes that come right a week later <laughs> or, uh, or when we're talking pre event indicators, it might be that they have lifetime best performances in say the, the, the couple of weeks before the event. And, uh, and that, and that to me means that we're, we're getting the loading wrong and, um, and or we're not placing some limits on the quality of the training we're doing we're reaching too much we're searching for confidence and then uh, perhaps leaving the performance in the training field and that's a very common mistake it happens all the time uh, but it's kind of unpicking what that means if you don't have it look at it with that perspective you might just keep repeating that over and over yeah i mean by all means like i i don't want to sound like i don't want to sound like oh you Everyone that's listening to this is making the mistakes, and and we're here, and we're we never make these mistakes. I mean, we make these mistakes, and and I've had athletes that uh, I've had athletes that were really fresh uh, on on Thursday, and uh, but their race was on Sunday, and uh, and I've had athletes that had a big uh, a big uh, a big goal on one week, and then the after fought race the next week, that's where they performed. You know, that's 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 going to that's going to happen, but I don't want to get caught into into a prediction game where I'm going to predict that uh, because the reverse of that the reverse of that thought is 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 that uh, you're looking at some indicator 
and says like, oh, this this guy is going to have a lifetime lifetime worst uh, performance. You know, what are you going to are you going to tell the athlete like, hey, I just looked at my um, at my at my TSS uh, manager here, and I just realized that you're going to DNF on Sunday. <laughs> you know, it's 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 never about that, right? So 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 uh, so I I would say that I would say that like we're talking about these things doesn't mean that like uh, you guys are getting all wrong and we're getting everything right. No, we, we also make those mistakes, but, but just want to stress how important it is to, to create a repeatable process that, that brings about performance instead of a uh, hit or miss, uh, hit or miss process that, uh, where performance is something, some sort of like magical uh, happening or a process where we're relying on, on data that is, um, uh, far from conclusive to just uh, gives us the confidence that uh, the confidence that uh, the performance is going to happen or not. Absolutely. So good, good thought provoking uh, uh, article tweet uh, podcast in, in the case of Vicky. So definitely gets the wheels turning for, for future for me and uh, interesting to think through it and, and talk through it. Um one of the things that also that I just wanted to touch on from from the uh, the article or the comment of of Siler, which which touches on something that we've um, believe is important and we've touched a lot on in this podcast is the the quote uh, the impact of um, total total frequency volume of training must be weighed against the background cycle repetition count. Um, or sorry, this this is really the impact of of technical training weighted against the background cycle repetition count. So this is this concept, and maybe you want to go into it since you you highlighted it was kind of the argument against traditional technique work, uh, in the sense that high volume, high frequency, or just general, if we just say endurance training, has a huge amount of cycle repetition count. So cadence you know the movement patterns we do a massive amount and yet when we're talking about technique work we're talking about yeah like take these 10 next 10 strokes swimming and put your hand this way and we're talking yeah but you've got you know a million strokes doing the other way and what is the impact of this and you know perhaps (laughs) that's what we're battling against when we're talking particularly with endurance athletes have been training a long time and we're trying to change uh, uh, biomechanics via, I would say, traditional technique work with this background cycle repetition count. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I tweeted about it and I highlighted it. And, and, uh, and, and you know, and this is not new, and I think we discussed this before, uh, that the whole technique work is, even if you're doing 10% of technique work, and then ninety percent of non technique work it it takes a a great amount of wishful thinking to think that uh that the technique work is sticking uh uh and the changes are being made when you're doing ninety percent of the of the of the work uh so basically uh and and this kind of thinking led me towards towards uh uh and uh, approaches that that if we're, we're going to be working on technique, then then we're going to be working on technique all of the time, you know. And you can think about it as you can think about it as uh, if we're going to change something or or work on a, a certain aspect in in an athlete's uh, swim stroke, then we're going to work it for a, a, a large chunk of the time. So basically, just to to give a crude example, if we're uh, if we're using paddles to to enhance uh, the catch on on one athlete, or to enhance uh, distance per stroke, uh, then we're going to do that, you know, for half of the volume or more that you're doing over over a week, and not just you know do one arms or two arms or or just go up and down for 800 after your warm up or as part of your warm up. That's going to have a limited effect, but if you can you can do it for a long a long uh, a long period of time then uh, then uh, then that's that's what's going to have a lasting mark and this is and this is this this goes uh, this goes uh, this is in line with uh, with with the kind of work that uh, that coaches do in 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 um, in more 
technical uh, uh, technical sports, like for example, uh, stuff like uh, like like hammer throw or or the short puts, where where basically there's obviously there's a big component of strength, uh, but uh, but but where technique is going to be everything, and 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 as you know, most most coaches that work uh, that work in those sports, they they. Uh, they focus on the on the whole movement and making corrections to the whole movement and not uh, so basically they're doing technique work all of the time if they're on out on the on the field so so um, so i think i thought this this was a this was a good uh, this was a good comment uh, from from Siler. and the other thing that was interesting is the question that he was asked about uh, where is the brain and brain training in this hierarchy fits and uh, and he, he he was a little bit sarcastic, but but it's funny that like brain training it sounds kind of like you know the latest fad that we gonna that we have <laughs> to deal with now and then and and now like you know it's pretty obvious that like everything that we do is brain training you know so if you're thinking that you, if you think that you're doing something that's not brain training then uh, then you shouldn't be doing that thing you know we're everything is brain training so so doing stuff like uh, when the red light when the r- red light uh, flashes and the green light flashes you click and when the red light flashes you don't click or or stuff like that you know that that kind of like sounds like a little bit like a fad and uh, so i kind of like enjoyed this comment of like hey it's everything's brain work <laughs> absolutely um i did see the that that it is an emerging topic this this brain training uh, uh concept and applicability to endurance board is is debatable but then um it's also as you say everything everything is brain training because particularly when we're talking about the approach of of integration then um then uh, it's something that we can we can put into everything i mean it's i feel like it's uh, it's like psychology in coaching uh, everything is psychology it doesn't need to be its own category all right, so we're moving on to some feedback and questions. So we've had a few uh, come in that were interesting that um, got us thinking. Um, one of the the first one we've talked a lot about swimming, and in the last episode we talked about thinking about the swimming approach for the winter, and they talk about toys and props we use for swimming, and if there's anything similar that we do with running and with the goal of improving running form and efficiency, high cadence drills, etc. And so. That question of what what do we do for running in the same way, um, and also you know another part of the question was uh, around weight training for improving running efficiency and and, and uh, 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 re- injury prevention, which I think we've touched on before, but is perennial evergreen that one. So first of all, mm-hmm. uh, running efficiency. What do you do? Are there toys? Are there tricks? Uh, contrast to swimming. Uh, yeah, first off, let me just like w- one of, one of my pet peeves is the efficiency versus economy. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's not get into that, but let's, let's talk about like running economy and, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I would make, I would make the, the bridge here where or I would say that most of the times the things that work with swimming that help swimming are, are going to be methods that, uh, that increase drag uh in some in some way so with running out it's 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 exactly the same thing and when we want to increase uh uh when we want to increase uh drag in in running then uh, then that that translates into hill hill running uh so so i like to call it drills <laughs> d-r-h-i-l-l uh so basically running hills i think is is the best drill uh best drill that uh, that you can use uh it works in uh, a few biomechanical uh uh it a few biomechanical uh variables i like to say that for as many uh as many different uh running styles i've i've seen of people running uh if you if you get somebody uh if you get somebody running up a hill at a fairly high intensity you're going to you're going to see uh a running form that's going to be uh, almost always an improvement from uh, from from runners' uh, normal uh, uh, normal uh, normal running form. So so I would come down to just talk about hills and 
I use heels extensively. Short heels, uh, long heels, uh, work uh, at constant uh, constant grade on the on the treadmill where we just work a grade for for an exceeding period of time, and uh, and and that fits the box of changing something, adding drag, and like I said earlier, uh, working on something for a long time so that so that we can work on maximum number of repetitions uh while changing something so so when it comes to uh when it comes to uh to props or toys that i use in running i would say i would say running hills yeah absolutely i think that's the, the same approach i mean any any runs we can get on the hills the the better and then specific sessions short long faster slow use it all uh, I would just add, you know, strides, flat, fast running, also a, a good uh, drill, if you like, um, in terms of being able to run fast in, in a relaxed way. And, um, you know, and finally, the other thing that there's some evidence to that you may not think of it in a, in this way, but is uh, running on, on different terrain, just, just simply off-road running a different terrain where there's uh, a, a bit of uh, different directions and maybe perhaps agility or you're having to use your, your feet. Uh, there's some evidence that, that that promotes economy over, um, over always tarmac concrete type running. Um, you know, it, it, you know, if, even if the fact that it takes more energy to run faster on, on softer or slippery services and then taking that same energy, uh, uh, you know, there's, again, there seems to be some transfer of economy, uh yeah and and another thing that that you mentioned that that this uh this this listener talked about that we discussed the lack of evidence around weight training i i don't think we talked about that actually actually there's uh there's good evidence regarding uh regarding uh weight training and uh to improve uh running economy to, uh, if you if you uh if you go into pubmed and uh and uh search for running economy uh, weight training you're gonna see uh you're gonna see some uh, some references there and uh and uh so the 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 evidence the evidence is there for uh for weight training uh, improving running economy but 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 uh but the the key the key with weight training to improve running economy is is load so basically uh you have to be lifting very heavy in order to see the gains in uh, in running economy coming from uh, from uh, from weight training and uh, and for me personally I always feel that uh, I always feel that uh, the injury risk from lifting very heavy uh, and you know doing stuff like doing stuff like heavy squats or uh, or or even like calf raises that are going to be really heavy uh, the the effect that the, the the trade-off between injury risk and uh, and benefits uh, uh, is not always great, and uh, and for uh, for a mode of strength training where the evidence is really good uh, to improve running economy and it's a lot safer, I would I would definitely turn into plyometrics. Plyometrics is a a strength training mode that uh, ends up being uh, it's very high intensity, but it's also you know I've never had anyone injured from doing uh from doing pliers and uh and when it comes to pliers i really like the the most the more simple stuff like uh drop boxes that's really easy to just control variables and uh and uh, and do and the evidence is really good so just uh just go on pubmed again and uh, you're gonna you're gonna see really good evidence uh, on uh on uh, plyometrics and the uh, running economy so so definitely i would say that uh there's definitely not a lack of evidence regarding weight training, uh, even if uh, the trade-off with injury risk might not might be attractive for somebody that's thinking like, "Hey, I want to I want to give this a try." For me, for me, uh, it's simply not attractive to uh, to the injury risk of of doing heavy weight training to uh, to improve running economy. Absolutely, and one of the things that we we've you know we've talked about a lot here, but is the 
longer term look at the bigger picture with these studies of course you can you can isolate you know a, a certain period of time and you might see improvements when you when you try to isolate a variable uh, such as uh, strength training um, however it's you got to look at the bigger picture so it's a matter of picking the tools that um, you think fit best into that as well you know um, and you know with regards to injury risk and sustainability so i think you've said it all there and and kind of as a follow-on to to running uh, economy um uh, question of what had we ever looked at a device called run scribe which is um just an it looks like an accelerometer at, that you attach to your shoes similar to the stride um uh, running monitor um, and with the advent of this sort of technology where uh, previously, these types of accelerometers would be very, very expensive, and basically, they've it's trickled down to them being relatively cheap. And uh, you know, if some in- enterprising companies have developed um, algorithms to show us some nice graphs and and things that um, we might be able to use these. So I've not used them um, in my coaching. I don't. I don't think you have because I had to tell you to Google Runscribe. Um, <laughs> And um, I think <laughs> I was going to, I was going to self-report that, but but thanks for throwing me under the bus, Joel. <laughs> sure, and 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 the the fellow uh, Neil, I believe, who asked this question. I mean, I think he probably said it best in that after using Runscribe for a while, he's got a bunch of pretty graphs, but that's about it. So, your hot take on this sort of thing, Paulo? Uh, yeah, my my hot take on 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 Runscribe is uh, like I said, you, I just googled it, so you can see that uh, uh, you can see that uh, my interest in it uh, going back to uh, uh, going uh, going back to the to Stephen Tyler's uh, Twitter account, which is uh, a personal. Uh, uh, I'm 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 a pretty big fan. He uh, he tweeted uh, he tweeted uh, uh, a plot that uh, that. That uh, that is called the Gartner hype cycle, and uh, and uh, and we can put this on the on the show notes. But basically, the 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 Gartner hype cycle is yeah, given given a technology trigger, uh, there's a there's a peak of inflated expectations, and so basically, when a new technology comes up, people like there's inflated expectations about what it's going to come, uh, and then there's a uh, there's a valley. Which which is the trust of disillusionment? This disillusionment, which is basically you end up thinking that seeing that like the technology is not going to do what you thought that it was going to do, and uh, and uh, but then you reach a plateau of productivity where you kind of like find the plateau that 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 technology is going to work for you, and uh, and a lot of these technologies that that are coming through, they are definitely they are definitely going through this cycle where it comes out and uh, most people go and think like, oh, this is amazing. The possibilities are endless, yada, yada, yada. And then when you start working with them, you kind of like think like, well, this, that's got a lot of limitations. And, uh, and hopefully you can reach, you can reach uh, a plateau and like, okay, we can work with, with this because we already know all the limitations and all that. And, uh, and definitely uh, these, uh, these uh, devices based on uh, accelerometers uh, are still going through the the the, the hype cycle and uh, and here's, here's my concern my concern is that the accelerometer data in the in the in the in the literature and particularly when it comes to running uh, it's not like decisive the evidence out there that says like okay we looked at the accelerometer uh, uh, data and we uh, successfully correlated these variables with running economy. We're definitely not there yet, and and we can we're probably not going to be there for for a while. So so basically, adding data it's going to just add noise to the to whatever process you're you're following, and uh, and I'm never going to like uh, you know subscribe to noise. So basically. Let's see. Let's see where these technologies are are going to end up, and if they're in the end, if they're useful, then uh, then we're going to be using them. Absolutely, we can move on. Then um, the next question really boils down to how to sustain fitness uh, between events, but specifically long run fitness. Um, 
And um, the question kind of orients around um, race schedule of, of uh, ultra marathons and, and other events. And but re- but really, I think the question comes back to is, is a common one, and, and we've touched on it to some degree with our discussion on periodization. But giving giving a concept of how do you sustain fitness, particularly long run fitness between events. So what what's your quick thought on that? Uh, let me just say that like in the last couple of years, I, I don't think I've, have, I've, I've been doing a good job with, uh, with, with this, uh, with this particular, uh, with this particular subject, but, uh, and, and this in part, because I, I kind of like question the value of long, the long run, uh, when, when it's not, when it's not specific or, or long running all of the time, but at the same time, at the same time, I'm I'm going into the process of of giving really good thought or questioning my approach in the last few years regarding maintaining long run uh, uh, long run fitness. So so I think it would be better for you. Why don't Why don't I throw this question back at you? And I would be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I, I much had the same thought. I, I when I read it, I was wondering. I wonder how well I'm doing on this because. It's very easy to for the long runs to sort of drop away. It depends what you consider long runs through a season. However, it's one thing I've actually tried to do more of and, and picking up in terms of that periodization discussion is to make sure that we revisit the, the duration of the long runs uh, through either the competitive season or through a, a retraining phase, if we think of a dual periodization um, or a mini periodization, um, to come back to it. And, um, you know, but the challenges around racing periods, around the intensity of racing periods, whether that's the best uh, uh, investment of energy. And, and I do think that there's a lot of value there. And, and the approach really is... Um, uh, of uh, using easy long runs, going back to the more simple, basic thing. You know, if you want to revisit that, if you want to maintain that, we're talking about maintaining some sort of durability uh, that you might get from a long run. Then if you're concerned about overall loading between events, because that's often what we're thinking about and why that's even a question is you think, well, between these events, what do I need to do to sort of maintain my fitness? And it may not necessarily need to be the longest long run of the year but it's got to be something that maintains some sort of durability uh, you can i think you can you can do that through double running and frequency if you're concerned about single single session loading which is often the the challenge so i mean if we've got a period of time between a couple events uh pretty ultra distance events if you think between two ironmans that's a common uh, thing that that we might end up with um I would just um, go for the duration before any sort of specificity of intensity and maintaining not a hundred percent of the longest, but you know, say eighty percent, and see if you know if, if that's doable, if that's repeatable uh, without sort of as much intensity in between events. Then, then you're probably gonna maintain the the adaptation that you want. Um, uh, to sort of be good for the second event. But if we, f- if we frame it in terms of dual Ironmans, uh, a certain number of weeks apart, does that change your answer? Uh, yeah, basically like, I, like in general terms, up until, up until now, I've been thinking that, you know, my athletes, we, we have like two hour running days all of the time. And, uh, and up until now I, I've been, I've been okay with doing, two times one hour, one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. And, and lately I've been having, I've been having my doubts in, in how that impacts, uh, how that impacts specificity later in the year. You know, let's think that, let's think that, uh, it's January and, uh, you're an Ironman athlete and you're doing one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you're the, you're the control group and, uh, and the work group is doing two hour runs. Uh, so doing the exact same volume. And then how does that translate into later in the year when we're trying to do uh, long runs at race pace or how, you know, so, so all the, all that's in my mind right now, which is up until now, I'm thinking like, are oh, we doing the work and we're doing the volume and uh, it's going to add up and going to be the same. But, uh, but maybe it's not the same. So definitely something that's that's been uh, 
a reflection of mine lately. I think maybe this rolls into the next question then, which is how do you structure an athlete season if they've got both early and late season races? And particularly we're talking about Im- sort of important races early and late season. And I think it's a really good question that flows through basically what we just talked about, but also the periodization discussion or the planning, the hierarchy of needs discussion about you know, what's important that leads to those performances, uh, what's important in terms of training prioritization that allows you to perform well, both early and late? Uh, yeah, you know, even even if the question is, is formulated in uh, Corona 70.3 Worlds, uh, WTS Grand Final, it, not everything is going to be the same. Basically, I would say that the density of competition is going to be a biggest determinant of what how you're going to approach it than anything else you know uh in triathlon you have you have both extremes which which are uh athletes that are focusing on ironman and basically focusing on one or two races a year and uh and basically just one we we talked about before just racing just focusing in uh on kona and then you have other athletes that uh their focus is distributed uh, uh, along uh races uh that that happen throughout the year i would say that like when you have and this is this is what happens to a lot of age groupers which they they might have uh you know two ironmans in a year and uh, and maybe two other or three other races uh then that that's where an approach that's based on a on a traditional periodization that's where uh that's where um uh where a traditional periodization model is going to uh be useful here which is a long build up uh let's say a 24 to 30 week build up where you're just building towards a race and uh and you do a lot of base training and uh and uh and then you do a lot of ironman specific training closer to the race uh i think that's where it's uh where it's going to be uh where a traditional periodization model is going to be useful on the other hand when you have uh, a scenario where uh, where your your ITU athlete that you're focusing on WTS racing, even if the grand final is going to be a big goal for the season, it's not like you're going to uh, spend the whole year training for the grand final and just uh, training through every other race or just focusing on the grand final. That's never going to happen. So basically, uh, the way ITU training is going to uh, going to work is by having a big block of training during the off season and then short blocks that prepare specific races uh specific races uh, that are coming up and then uh and then the way you prepare the grand final is probably towards like longer taper being more rested making more uh specific training towards towards that race and so so it, I feel that like in triathlon and different kinds of triathlon, there's going to be both extremes of training just for one event for a long time and training for a multitude of events. I think I like the way you said about the density determining the density of your competition calendar also having a significant impact. So, so really with that meaning that the more competitions you're doing through the year, um, the bigger impact that potentially has on some of the factors that allow you to perform well later. So typically what we see is, you know, there's a big demand for athletes to want to go out and race, whether it be a bunch of smaller races in between the major ones. And too many of those means you get away from the fundamental stuff of of just the the fundamental frequency and volume that we talked about before. You get away from the distribution uh, the, the o- over time that elicits those performances. So, you know, if you're racing too often, which you see very, very common, uh, racing, you know, many, many times through the year, then it gets difficult to sustain a nice performance at the end of that because, you you know, the your your form, if you like, or your chronic training load is decayed. Um, so you've got to come back to that. So that's where the planning is is important of how do you how do you structure things so that uh, you can fill in some of those gaps, um, uh, you know, during the year, you know, if you build in build in time to to come back to long runs, to come back to long rides, to come back to strength work, to, you know, to to re re 
uh, load some of the areas that might have fallen off during the the travel, the competition, uh, the recovery, the tapering in and out of small events. So certainly what I don't uh, do is sort of tr try to train through events in order to achieve this outcome because for a lot of different reasons, but I just think it's it's very stressful to to do that, uh, except for very low level events. Um, that's not the strategy that we're using. I think it's more how you structure and plan the year. Yeah, training through events. That's something that uh, <laughs> they've done that and abandoned it completely. Uh, it's 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 just uh, it's just a, a losing proposition because. Uh, particularly like for athletes that need to travel extensively for races, uh, just asking an athlete to do a four hour ride the day before a race after getting out of a plane is probably not a great idea. Uh, so, so basically, and that's, and that's the message that I convey to my athletes. It's like, you know, obviously there are races more important than others, but every time we're racing, we're going to get ready to race and not just have the race be an afterthought. And a lot of times, I see coaches conditioning athletes to for races to be after uh, you know, like for example, having a ride after after the race, or uh, or having a lot of training to do like the day before the race or race day, and uh, and uh, and uh, I don't like how that trivializes racing and and uh, and uh, and and opens the athletes to just having an inbuilt uh, a justification to for to not perform you know it's just if you tell an athlete and i've seen that before just like if you tell an athlete to ride four hours a day before a race uh it's not like you're just telling the message is telling is like if you don't perform the next day it's not really a big deal and uh and uh, i don't think that enhances anyone's uh anyone's process absolutely so the last one um the last question last follow-up question for today how does gear affect injuries? So if you have the wrong shoes, for example, could you have handle less training load? If your bike fit is not correct, do you get more injuries? Um, quick take on that gear and injuries. How does gear affect injuries? Tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I think you've had to deal with this as well, which is uh, sponsor, Sponsor Z comes up to an athlete and says, "I'm going to pay you or give you free stuff, and uh, you're going to use this this product, and then uh, and then the product is subpar, and then you the athlete ends up uh, injured. You know, this has happened to me a lot of the times. Uh, we've had to have uh, athletes uh, uh, break contracts or not wear the sponsor's gear because it's subpar and it's causing an injury. This happens all the time, uh, particularly with running and running shoes." Running shoe uh, selection is something that's really, 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 really important, and uh, and uh, and never it's never worth it for you to get paid uh, to uh, to to wear something that uh, that's not going to be working for you. And the same with age group athletes, a lot of the times you get a discount or something is cheaper, or you think something is more expensive, and and therefore. Uh, Therefore, it's going to be better for you, and uh, and no, you need to be very careful with the uh, with the uh, with the shoes that you that you that you select, and the same with uh, like you know the only the only source the only source for injury in bike in bike training it's either if you crash or if your bike fit is not correct, and so and so bike fitting ends up being uh, uh, being being very important and and often often a source of uh, of injuries and i've i've had situations even if i take care of the of the bike fit uh, for my athletes i've had injury uh uh i've had um, times where where a bike fit was was okay for an athlete and then stopped being okay and we had to make changes so so these these are all factors that are going to impact performance and they're going to impact the injury uh injury rates and that that you have to be uh have to be uh, aware and uh, and and always on the lookout for how these these factors impact injuries in athletes. Uh, absolutely, I mean, particularly with the um, the the commonality now of of bike fits and frequent bike fits. I mean, it seems like every week there some athletes are getting another bike fit, and um, 
Well, the the idea behind sort of optimization, you know, may be valid. Often these little changes, you know, some athletes' bodies just don't handle those well. Um, and it's, again, the, the, we often talk about the law of unintended consequences. You know, you, you change something and there's going to be some sort of impact uh, in biomechanics farther up or down the chain that you might not anticipate. You know, and it's just transferring load from one area to another. And um, we often get athletes that are so adapted to moving in a particular way that uh, change them at your peril. When this particular on bikes, suppose, would go to cleats and, and pedals type thing. But but could easily be saddles uh, can, can change the way you sit fundamentally, you know. Yeah. I was going to say, like, one thing that bike feeding a lot of the time is about angles and uh, – and uh, what's going to be your knee angle, what's going to be your hip angle, uh, and and not a lot of people work uh, with with uh, with shoes and uh, and cleat placement. But for example, like cleat placement is huge in bike fitting. Uh, I've had athletes with big problems coming from from uh, from uh, cleat placement. So bike shoes and cleat placement is is something that's really important. Uh, something something that uh, is Really important is like never change bike shoes mid season. Always change bike shoes at the end of a season when you're preparing the next season. For example, like be very careful with the state of your cleats and uh, if they're working and the placement of your cleats. Just uh, because because uh, you're gonna get injured in cycling is is with incorrect uh, uh, bike fit and and bike fitting is something that's very it's dynamics. Something that might have worked for you in the past might not work for you in the future. So, so it doesn't mean that you always have to be making changes, but you got to be open to the idea that something that was not that was working before is not working in the future. So, so that kind of like process where we just try to make uh, small changes is incredibly important. And back to the the running shoes example, I mean, I, I know um, from working with a number of elite athletes, I've, a few times where athletes have wanted to change sponsors. Uh, maybe swayed by the new sponsor, the newness of shoes, and ended up having big problems as a result. Because, as you said, all, all shoes and brands are not created equal. There's subtle differences, uh, and even even just the lure of free gear at times uh, can 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 have a negative impact. To, and it reminds me of an example of um, there's a British athlete uh, called Jessica Ennis who is a heptathlete, gold medalist, multi medalist, and one point she was she was suffering some from from some injuries, some foot injuries. Injuries, and they traced it back to that her shoe sponsor had changed the last of the shoes that she was using. So the last is the shape of the shoe. And um, she hadn't even changed the model, but the shape had changed enough that it was causing a problem. They traced it back to that. And uh, she was, you know, a, bi- a big enough athlete that they actually got the shoe sponsor to start up a new run of the mold of the old shoe for her, which is not what everyone's going to be able to do but but even again the example that even the old the model that you might be using i mean shoe companies are just always updating them and subtle things can change and uh, and even that can have an impact particularly when we're talking high volume athletes you're more uh, susceptible to differences you know you get more sensitive when all the various muscle stabilizer muscles etc get fatigued um so so that can that can be a big factor and the other factor is sort of that what we've seen the trend of the sexiness if you like of low profile shoes or low drop shoes and all of these things and athletes that want to they're pursuing some sort of performance improvement in their mind and they go to these types of shoes and uh and if I was to generalize, the, these these types of shoes have been great for the medical industry. They've kept a lot of people in business, a lot of physios in business, a lot of massage therapists are delighted with this trend, you know. And um, because you can't just lower your the heel on your shoe and not expect some sort of consequence to happen, and usually it's not good. And you know, usually we go the we go the opposite direction. The higher volume that you're going, the more the more you want a nice structured, stable shoe to to support that volume so uh, if you've got a lightweight shoe you actually might be able to handle less training load running and and vice versa going the other way so you often see quite elite athletes um running in 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 pretty a lot of the easy long runs etc in kind of quite kind of more bulky shoes um 
if their mechanics suit it to in order to be able to do those miles because in the end you know the perceived benefit from these low drop you know shoes that make your foot work harder etc um perhaps is not as great as the benefit of just being able to run more yeah absolutely uh and so like gear gear choices as as huge impact on the on the on how athletes uh, how athletes perform and this is the kind of stuff that you know you're not going to read about it no athlete's going to come and say like hey these guys that are giving me free stuff or are paying me a salary turns out that they just changed the model and now i'm all screwed up you know you're not going to hear stuff about that and uh, and it's it's often huge and uh, and i think in triathlon we have a, spe- a very specific problem where because it's a market where there's a lot of money uh you have you have a lot of uh you know, businessmen developing products are going to be specific for triathletes and uh, and often more expensive and and lower quality and uh, and that's and uh, and and that's often running shoes. You know, you have companies that uh, develop uh, running shoes specifically for triathletes and uh, and uh, and would not with really subpar products and uh, and they often want to sponsor our athletes and. Uh, and uh, and that's 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 going to be like a losing proposition for 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 everyone involved. It's actually very interesting to think of how there are triathlon specific running shoe companies and why that market exists. So I think you just said why it exists, but that's interesting to think about in that way. You know, um, there's a certain um, t- uh, dynamic of the market that lends itself towards you know, pursuing these sort of technological gains that are thought of as technological gains that um, perhaps are not so much when you peel back the layers. But um, we go on and well, on according about to that. The la- yeah, according to the latest news, one of those brands is actually uh, is actually going under. So, uh, so maybe the market has uh, spoken. Right. So... Good questions. Thanks for the questions. I think it all flowed uh, from from our discussion about planning and and um, periodization and and how we uh, bring a lot of these factors together today. So keep the questions coming. We've got we've got uh, a few more for next week, and we'll we'll keep these going as they come in. It certainly gets us thinking and talking about them. A reminder: we're on um, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes. Uh, nerds amongst you might notice that we switched podcast host to Libsyn now, so things will still go up on SoundCloud, uh, but uh, subscribers shouldn't notice any real difference. Um, so, yeah, that's that's all been updated behind the scenes. And send us questions, podcast at joefilio.com, and uh, have a look at the links to uh, the Vicky Holland interview and the Stephen Seiler hierarchy of training needs in the show notes.